Sorry guys. Um, yeah, this is much nicer. Um, let's talk about entitled CO2. So I think we're all fairly familiar, at least conceptually with entitled CO2, right? It's essentially the volume of CO2 exhaled on a patient's breath. That's pretty much it. We have different ways of quantifying that. There's qualitatively uh, with the colometric device, which essentially changes the pH um, and it goes from purple to yellow as a response to CO2 changing the pH of that colometric device. Uh, and then you have the quantitative devices, which are side stream and mainstream capnography. Um, functionally, they essentially function the same. There's slight different nuances. Uh, the first one is there's a delay to picking up your end title with the side stream. So you'll intubate the patient and it'll be a couple of breaths before you actually start to see the pickup up your end title, whereas mainstream is pretty instantaneous. And the other thing is like, if you have an airway that's full of blood or secretions, you're far more likely to get the mainstream one contaminated and it'll stop working than the side stream. But otherwise, functionally, we can sort of uh, treat them as the same. Uh, you get three essential pieces of information from an entitled waveform. You get the waveform itself, and we'll talk a little bit later about how to like look at this waveform and get some insight into what's going on with the patient. You have the peak entitled value, which is essentially the highest value of expelled CO2 on every breath, and then you have the respiratory rate. Um, so entitled is cool um, and it's beneficial in some ways because there's multiple factors that determine your entitled CO2, but at the same time, it's somewhat hard to interpret because there's multiple factors that determine your entitled CO2. Um, it's the ventilation, the CO2 production, um, and the perfusion, right? And so all these things combine together to give you one single number. So without having a concept or an idea of what's going on with your patient physiologically, you can't always determine what that meaning of your single end title number is. So this is a basic uh, waveform of end title, and you essentially have these four phases. The first phase, um, which is your baseline, let me see if I can do this upside down. Your baseline phase over here uh, is end inhalation and the start of exhalation. As you start to exhale, the first thing that comes out of the patient's mouth is the the air that was in the dead space in the previous inhalation, which for the most part is oxygen. So you're basically going to have a flat line. As you start to wash out that dead space, you start to get a pickup in your, in your CO2 level, right? And that uh, escalation happens pretty quickly. And when you get to that stage three or the plateau is essentially alveolar CO2, right? Um, which reaches its peak sometime at that beta angle uh, on the right side of your screen. Um, and then you're going to have a downstroke on inspiration, which immediately cuts off your CO2 as the patient breathes in more oxygen, again, your CO2 level goes to zero. That's essentially what a basic end tidal waveform looks at. Knowing that physiology, when we can now look at waveforms, it'll tell us a little more about their physiology. But the first thing let's do is talk about the uses and misuses of end tidal. Uh, the first one is, can you use end tidal as a surrogate or a replacement of a blood clot? And unfortunately, the answer is no. Your end tidal, because it is a representation of perfusion, metabolic rate, and ventilation, um, doesn't always represent what your PCO2 represents. It is always at least your, what your PCO2 is or higher. So you'll never have an end title that as ends up being higher than what your PCO2 level is, but you can have a PCO2 that's much higher than what your end title number is, right? And so you have to get a blood gas to kind of see if your end title is representation of your PCO2. Now, once you have a blood gas that tells you that your PCO2 and your end title are similar, sure, you can use it then as a surrogate for a blood gas. So I would argue, once you know what the person's PCO2 is, you understand what their mid-ventilation needs are, you very rarely need to get more blood gases anyway. What it is a good marker of, and what I like to use it for, is the representation of dead space. Again, if you have a patient who you're pretty sure is not in shock, and you have a big difference between your end title and your PCO2, it's usually a representation of the dead space ventilation that's going on and to whatever disease state they're in. And what I really like to use it for in those cases, especially it becomes relevant in like ARDS, as you start to recruit lung and you start to get the patient closer and closer to FRC, you start to improve their, their VQ mismatch and you start to decrease that physiological dead space. And so your end title starts to get closer and closer to your actual PCO2. And so for me, it's a marker of getting people closer to FRC. Procedural sedation. So end title, probably the best data for it and probably the, the best use of it is this dichotomous ventilation, yes or no, right? Because again, whether just because there's components that make up ventilation, perfusion, and CO2, you will always have a waveform if the patient's ventilating. So to use it as a dichotomous yes, no, it becomes a very handy thing. 
procedural sedation obviously is, is this area where this is very effective. Um, if you have someone on procedural sedation, um, there's a high relevance that they stop breathing. This happens a lot. I think the data is something about 20 or 30%. In practice, it seems to be more than that. Um, and this will tell you way before the patient starts to desaturate, especially if you've pre-oxygenated the right way, if they are hypoventilating at the time. I will say that when you put the nasal, the nasal cannula prongs in, it almost always seems to be as soon as you push your sedative, you lose it, airway tone and they become mouth breathers instantaneously. Um, and so it's less effective than I'd like it to be. Um, but at least from a bulk ventilation standpoint, it's fairly useful. So again, bulk ventilation, intubation, determining if in your airway or not, it becomes a very useful tool. I'm not asking you to interpret what the number means, what it represents, just airway or not airway. It's very useful. I would say the other part of intubation that it becomes incredibly useful is differentiating the difference between pulse ox lag and not being in the airway. So your pulse ox, the number is about 30 seconds to two minutes delayed from what you're seeing on the screen. The sicker the patient is, the more of a pulse ox lag you'll see. So the patient's actual saturation starts to drop before you actually see the number change. And so you have this scenario where I've tried to intubate, I failed my first attempt, I don't know how to perform a crike because, you know, why would I know how to do that? Um, and I start to bag the patient, right? And so at some point your sat's gonna drop. And what you wanna know is, is that, strop, is that saturation dropping because of pulse ox lag, meaning I'm seeing the natural delay drop in my sat from when I couldn't intubate this patient and I feel comfortable that's gonna come back up, or is this sat dropping because I'm not ventilating the patient? And that's hard to figure out without an end title hooked up to your BVM. If you can hook an end title up to your BVM, you can actually now see your ventilation. And you can see that you're adequately ventilating the patient. And so no longer do you have to be concerned that this pulse ox lag is actually representative of a can't ventilate situation. I find that is probably one of the most helpful quantitative uses in the intubating scenario of end title, which is what we were illustrating here. Um, so finally, cardiac arrest. Um, again, this is, uh, has multiple uses. I think the easiest and, and best described is simply like intubation, yes, no, in the airway or not, right? And so again, you don't have to interpret the number, you just have to interpret that they have a waveform representative of ventilation. You can use this to, to assess whether your, your supraglottic airways are ventilating the patient appropriately. There's lots of good data now that we don't have to intubate people in cardiac arrest, that supraglottic airways work just as well. And so simply putting a supraglottic airway in tends to sil silence a lot of the new noise in the room when you're trying to intubate someone in cardiac arrest. The best way to assess where you've placed your supraglottic airway correctly and it's working is that you have an end tidal waveform. Now, as far as using end tidal as a, as a resuscitative tool during the cardiac arrest, I think that data is a little less successful. What you can say is it's a pretty good marker of what's happening with my CPR right now in this moment, meaning for the most part, as long as the person at the head of his bed isn't bagging at 60 times a minute, it's a representation of cardiac output and how your CPR is working, right? I think the mistake is, is it an actual modifiable factor? Meaning, can I change out CP, uh, for practitioners and get better performance? Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. The other thing to note, it's not essentially the best prognostic factor of outcome. It tells you what's happening in the moment right now with your CPR, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what's happening as far as likelihood of ROS, likelihood of long-term survival. There is some data suggesting that if you have an end title less than 10 for greater than 20 minutes, the chance of meaningful neurological outcomes are pretty low. I would argue if you have someone in cardiac arrest for greater than 20 minutes without ROS, the chance of meaningful uh, neurological outcomes is also pretty low. So whether it adds to that is, is, is a question. All right, so let's get into waveform. So this is the idea that I can actually get some insight into what's happening with our patient, not based on the number, but based on what the waveform looks like. And if we remember, this is what our normal waveform looks like, right? It's a flat line with a rapid upstrike with pretty rapid washout of the dead space into an alveolar plateau of CO2 which then peaks and is cut off again at inspiration, right? When this waveform changes, it tells us a lot about the physiology. I think the most classic one that everyone learns about is asthma or obstructive lung disease. This is the shark fin, right? And so what's happening here is you have that prolonged exhalation phase. And so you have prolongation of washing out of the dead space. So you don't get a nice peak alpha angle and a straight flat line at the top. Rather, you have this slow slope 
as this, as the dead space as the anatomic dead space washes out slowly and finally equalizes at some end point towards the top right this is pretty indicative of obstructive lung disease of some sort it doesn't mean that they're breast stacking it doesn't mean that you have to change your settings it means i have to go pay attention and look at the patient and decide what to do right if you look at it carefully you can actually see this improve with in, improved treatments with your obstructive lung disease this is what's cure right cleft. It's essentially an ineffective inspiration. This is often mostly seen on the ventilator, right? And so again, I've got my flat line. I've got a rapid increase to my plateau. And then halfway through my plateau, I've got this kind of pull down. What the, what's happening here is the patient's trying to generate a breath. So sucking in, unable to actually generate a full inhalation. And so you have return of CO2 back up to its, up to its peak before the next breath goes in. Um, this usually happens with vent dyssynchrony. Um, and so you can start to kind of reassess the patient and see why they're not able to trigger their own breath. This can simply be from uh, muscle fatigue uh, or muscle wasting. It can be because you've had them on the wrong vent settings. Your trigger is too low. Your peep is too high. Um, essentially, it's not diagnostic itself, but again, it should make you take a look at the patient and see what's going on. So right main stem intubation, this is a great one because you can call it off your end title. Um, what you see here is rather than a straight peak slope at the top, you have an initial slope and then a higher slope becomes delayed. And what's happening here is you've right main stem it. And so you're basically created a VQ mismatch, right? And if you've created a VQ mismatch, you have a lower end tidal coming back, right? Remember ventilation, perfusion, and metabolic components, right? And so here you've created a delayed um, or an instantaneous VQ mismatch, which then uh, kind of fixes itself as the gas kind of recirculates from usually the left lung back up into the tube, right? And so you eventually reach the same end tidal, but because of this cleft, you get what looks like a right main stem. And it's something you can actually call off your uh, end tidal waveform if you're uh, paying attention. This is my favorite. So this is for poor lung clients. So you see this in obesity, ARDS. Essentially what's happening here is you have alveolar collapse, right? And so you, you get your peak upstroke, you get your plateau, but then when that alveolar collapse, you actually get extra CO2 being exhaled that normally sits in the lung when you're at FRC. And so this is fa fairly indicative of poor compliance, right? As you are recruiting patients' lungs, you will see this start to resolve, right? And it is indicative of the fact that you're starting to stabilize the lung. This makes you think that whatever your settings are on whatever type of ventilation you like, APRV, you haven't quite stabilized the lung and you should think about actually increasing your PEEP, changing your, your settings to try to stabilize. So in summary, remember there's three different components of end tidal, ventilation, CO2 production, and perfusion. They all affect end tidal in ways that it's very hard to predict prior. Understanding your patient's physiology gives you insight into what the end tidal in front of you means. Um, and as long as you on your, understand your patient's physiology, you're then able to use this in a therapeutic fashion. Thank you.